Well, welcome to the podcast, Rick. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. So I brought on Rick to speak on the kind of medical benefits of marijuana. And this is something that is highly stigmatized. And I'm entirely excited to have this conversation for change of perspective and to bring things to light and maybe educate people on and like something I want to get out of the way is like I don't know if this is something that I would ever be willing to do and I'm not like this isn't an episode of like telling the audience to go do something like this most of the audience of our audience I think might be in 12-step programs I just wanted to provide this perspective because I find it very highly interesting and I think A lot of the times when we think of people in recovery and substance use, it's very black and white of like, you have to be sober or you're not. And yeah. So who are you? Tell me a little bit about yourself and like why. Gotcha. Um, My name is Rick Glass. Um, I grew up in Carroll County, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Um, I joined the Marine Corps um, after high school. So I was in the Marine Corps from 2001 to 2005. I went through two combat tours when I was in the Marine Corps, one in 2003 and one in 2005. Um, 10 years ago, if somebody would have said I was going to be on a podcast (laughs) talking about cannabis, I probably would have laughed. Um, I really, really like the quote. Um, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. Oh yeah. Cause I think that's, that's, that kind of really, really strikes me. This has been very, very life changing for me. And I think, um, what we really, really need to focus on is cannabis education. Um, when it comes down to cannabis, my goal is not to convince anyone to use it. I know how much it's benefited my life, and I feel like if it's benefited my life as much as it has, it would be irresponsible and it would be selfish for me to keep a lot of this information to myself. Um, I know it's helping so many different veterans. I know it's helping a lot of people, just people with chronic pain, people with opioid addictions. Um, I've seen it. Um, I've been working in the cannabis industry for the past five years. Um, Right now, I kind of took a little bit of a step back. I think education is very, very important. And I think that education needs to occur before somebody steps into an actual cannabis dispensary. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of stigma that needs to be reduced. And there's a lot of uh, education that really, really needs to happen when it comes to cannabis. Yeah. Um, One thing that we really, really have to focus on is everybody has an endocannabinoid system, whether we like it or not. The endocannabinoid system is responsible for a lot of different functions in the body. What we're doing is taking phytocannabinoids, cannabis, weed, Mary Jane, whatever you want to call it. We're taking phytocannabinoids and affecting an already present system. Um, Any medication, there's going to be some risks. There's going to be some concerns. There's going to be some things to talk about. But um, cannabis, I can honestly say, has absolutely saved my life. Um, I am a daily cannabis consumer. Um, I have not consumed a single prescription medication in over six years. And I'm coming up, well... I just crossed over seven years without a single alcoholic drink. Yeah. Um, my sobriety day is kind of part of my story. I had a lot of legal issues, had a lot of troubles um, yeah. in my personal life when it came to my alcoholism. I was drinking towards the end of it about a half gallon a day. Um, got arrested in Carroll County on April 19th, 2017, and checked myself into the Martinsburg VA rehab in uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my official... Alcohol-free date, because, again, hopefully that's kind of something we're going to talk about is getting caught up in the semantics of what sobriety is. Yeah. But my alcohol-free date is 4-20-2017. So <laughs> that's so funny. Every year I get to enjoy, you know, my alcohol-free date, but I also get to enjoy, you know, cannabis holiday. And mm-hmm. just looking back to my high school days and even in the Marine Corps days, and I would make fun of that 4-20 date, and now it's something that... It's a very, very big There's no way that's a coincidence, especially Mm -hmm. when you got sober, you wanted to be free from every substance. Correct. And And I wasn't a cannabis consumer at the time. If I was using cannabis at the time, it said, okay, this is the day. But I wasn't even using cannabis at the time. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of judgments about it. I had friends, you know, who used it in high school and stuff. But I was very, very You personally had judgments on marijuana. Absolutely. Fat, stupid, and lazy. That's what cannabis does to you. It makes you fat, stupid, and lazy. Yep. (laughs) That's That's the stereotype with it. I grew up with my dad smoking weed and I hated it because it caused so many like issues and arguments between like my parents and Mm -hmm. and I knew my mom it made my mom mad so Mm -hmm. when my mom wasn't home and I just could smell it like seeping under like you know the Mm -hmm. the door I was I would like start banging on the door and like just Mm -hmm. be so upset that my dad was smoking weed because so I had like a bad relationship with weed I'm like this is bad thing that I'll probably never do if I would have had that type of exposure, yeah. my life might be a little bit different. I mean, cannabis was yeah. an absolute no-go in my house. Um, 
my father was a Anne Arundel County firefighter for 28 years, um, pretty straight laced. Uh, alcohol was always a thing. Alcohol was pretty much readily available. Um, I started drinking, I would say pretty serious, probably eighth, ninth grade. I had a brother who was two years older than me, so I feel like my exposure to a lot of things was a little bit advanced more than everybody else. Yeah. But um, alcohol was a problem for me even before I joined the Marine Corps. I think the Marine Corps just really, really highlighted that a lot. Um, alcoholism in the Marine Corps is not really something that's addressed either. That's kind of something that's pushed. Um, yeah. A lot of events are just alcohol related. So I just noticed that when I got back from my tours in Iraq, that my alcohol drinking just took a little bit of a different light. Um, mm -hmm. Much more isolated. The volume went up the emotional outbursts. So it was yeah. a different reason for drinking alcohol. But as far as alcoholism goes, I think I was showing signs of that even in high school. So okay. I don't want to just blame and say, oh, if I didn't go to Iraq, I wouldn't be. I think I was going to be an alcoholic regardless. But I just think that uh, my combat tours really, really kind of yeah. highlighted a lot of those things. 100 so. percent. Mm -hmm. So you went to treatment for 20, 2017. Mm -hmm. And then what was like kind of your journey going from there? So that was my uh, third time in rehab. Okay. Um, I did two other rehabs, which were pretty unsuccessful. Um, I kind of already knew that they were going to be unsuccessful. You can, you may start making those, you know, justifications in your head. Yeah, I you distinctly, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I distinctly remember during my second rehab, um, I went to rehab in the summer and just talking to friends about eating crabs, steam crabs in Maryland is a really, really big thing. And I just distinctly remember saying to myself in my head, well, when I eat crabs, maybe it'll be okay if I have a beer or two. Mm -hmm. The idea of eating crabs without, you know, without drinking any type yeah. of beer was just completely blew my mind. So I think if you're saying stuff, stuff like that, you're really, really just making some really big justifications and you're just not ready. You're really, yeah. really not ready. And guess what? I had crabs the other day and I didn't drink any beer <laughs> and it was completely fine. You know, yeah. it was absolutely fine. Yeah, I feel like mm -hmm. that's that classic alcoholic thinking that I've, that I've heard a lot. Right, Yeah. right. What kind of made you find like the medical marijuana world? What was the introduction for you? I had a really, really bad experience at the VA through multiple times. Um, the VA has helped me out a lot. Obviously, I got my rehab there. But as far as some of the medications and even some of the mental health treatment, even the counseling there, um, subpar in my opinion. So I kind of decided to go a different route. But even doing that, I probably spent a solid year without consuming any type of medication and without consuming cannabis and really chart doing some investigation and figure out what's going on. You raw dogged it, no medication whatsoever? Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, talking to a lot of veterans, um, hearing some of their experience and saying, hey, maybe it's time for me to open up and really look at what this cannabis actually is. Um, I distinctly remember my third time going into rehab. Um, I was an absolutely broken individual. Yeah. Um, I didn't know where to turn. I was pretty much helpless. And I will never forget going into the elevator and going up uh, to the fourth floor of the Martinsburg VA Medical Center, tears rolling down my face, and there was a World War II veteran in the elevator. And I guess he just knew kind of why I was there, but he looked at me and he said, son, are you trying to get sober? And I said, absolutely. And he said, what are you willing to do? And I said, anything. And he said, that's the wrong answer. The answer is everything. Mm. that completely changed my life because I think that's what we ha how we have to look at sobriety, how we have to look at mental health. One model might not work for every single person. Yeah, 1, And I think percent. that's kind of where we get really, really caught up is you have to do this, this, and this. And that might work for one individual, but that might not work for somebody else. Just like cannabis. I have met plenty of people in my life that have no business using cannabis. Even people with some previous psychiatric disorders, even if somebody's debatable, you know, schizophrenic, that's probably not the best canon that, you know, to use cannabis. But I really, really opened my eyes and looked at started, you know, started to look at the different compounds. Yeah. I think we're really, really limiting ourselves when it comes to cannabis education. THC and CBD, like that's all we really, really, really talk about. And there's so many more things about this plant that we can really talk about that could really give somebody a better quality of life. All these other minor cannabinoids that can really, really affect the brain and really affect the body yeah. are super important to really, really talk about. Yeah, with my experience getting sober, obviously, like, I had my, my reservations, and a lot of people consider that reservations. Because I think initially, like, when people go into treatment, they almost don't view... From what I witnessed, most people didn't really view, like, marijuana as, like, a real drug. 
It's like, no, I just had to get off of Xanax or I just had to get off of the heroin. We would be okay. That's what I plan on doing afterwards. And that was kind of my thought process when I went to treatment. I was like, I'm just going to go home, maybe have a few drinks. Like, I think I can handle that. And then also smoke weed. And then from like what everybody told me in treatment, it's just like, maybe Lysha, that won't be the best route. Because when I smoked, I was smoking all day, every day. Mm -hmm. When I drank, I was out of control. I was angry, wanting to fight you or driving. That's why like it wasn't an, and from the experiences that I've heard, it just wasn't an option or a route for me because I, I wouldn't use, I doubt I would use marijuana respectfully in a way. And I don't think it's an option for everybody. And of course, reco- yeah, like what you said, for recovery, using marijuana medicinally isn't, yeah, isn't an option for everybody. And I don't think it would be an option for me just because of my experience of the way I used to smoke. I just think people are willing to experience a lot of negative effects from a lot of different substances and a lot of different drugs. Yeah. And when it comes to cannabis, they're making definitions off of an entire class of drug off of one single experience. I've noticed that especially with our elderly patients or just people, you know, in the, you know, out in public talking to them about cannabis, you hear something like, I used cannabis one time when I was 16 years old in my friend's basement and I freaked out Yeah, and I'll never use it ever again. And I think that's really, really limiting, you know, the power of cannabis because you can't base it off of one single experience. Now in Maryland, other states are kind of following suit. Some states don't really do it the correct way. I don't agree with Mm -hmm. everything that the Maryland Cannabis Administration has done. But as far as their labeling, as far as putting the specific terpenes the specific cannabinoids on every single label, I think that's very, very, very important. And I think that's kind of what is the problem is that people aren't educated enough. What I consume before I go to the gym and what I consume before I go to bed cannabis-wise are two totally different things. And it's not based upon THC and sativa and indica. Ugh, those words kind of, they bother me a little bit. (laughs) There are two classifications of plants, but people just have this idea, sativa during the day, indica at night. Mm-hmm. You'll hear like indica in the couch. Um, it's just not that simple. I think we really, really need to break down these actual compounds of this plant. It's not simple. It's just I'm going to use the sativa during the day. I'm going to use the indica at night. We have to go more a little complex bit more. than that. Way, 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 way more in depth. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, where I was going with it was literally in the entirety of my sobriety, I've heard nothing but negative things about using weed. And then another point you made was we consider medications, like say we're taking medications prescribed from a doctor, like Lexapro, hydroxyzine, trazodone, all these other things. It's like, that's okay. Cause it's like a pill form that came from a doctor and I'm still sober. But when somebody's using marijuana medicinally, that's an issue. Like you're getting high. You mentioned like you have an issue with the word, like, Oh, you're, you're a person that gets high. Right. And I think that's really getting caught up into a lot of semantics because I get high every single day. Does that mean that I'm not sober? We're really, really getting caught up into the individual. What what does that mean? You know, Um, cannabis can be used to absolutely run away from your problems. And I think that that can become an issue. Somebody can become overly medicated. Um, A specific example. I am in no business to tell somebody that the amount of cannabis that they're using is too much or too little. There are so many different reasons why people use cannabis. We have cancer patients. We have people who are dealing with sleep issues, people who just have mild anxiety. But I'm not in the the business to say this is the right amount of cannabis that you need. I had a patient come in who was consuming a large amount of cannabis. Um, It was a product called Terpsap. And comes in a syringe, which is already people, ooh, you know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but um, it is just a distillate of cannabis, but it's approximately 800 milligrams of THC in one of those in one of those grams of that syringe. And she was purchasing; she was struggling with opioids, and she was purchasing one of those every single day. Yeah. And while she was making a purchase with me, she opened up the conversation and she asked me. She said, "Rick, do you think this is too much weed to be using every single day?" And I said, I am in no position to answer that. I said, I can ask you a question. Are you trying to run away from something or are you trying to fix some of your problems? And she literally started bawling and started talking about a domestic abuse situation and some other issues that she had going on in her life. So that is a little bit of the, (laughs) but you can do that with any medication. And I think that's kind of what I really, really want to focus on when it comes to being an active member of AA or an active member of NA. Um, 
well, I'm on an antidepressant and my doctor says that I need this antidepressant to really, really help balance out my life and it's really, really helping me. There are people out there who are using cannabis as an antidepressant. Yeah. You know, I just don't understand why we have this, well, this is okay and this isn't. When right. if it's used responsibly, we can use this like medication. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be so severe. I know people have this idea of trying to separate the medical and recreational. Yeah. And it's like, well, if somebody has cancer, then it's okay for them to use cannabis. It's like, guys, there's a lot of other things that are going on in people's lives. Things don't have to get that bad. People are dealing with mood disorders. People are dealing with pain. People are dealing with sleep issues. You don't have to have something so debilitating in order to benefit from some of this. Me personally, if somebody had pain in their foot and they were debating, hey, I'm going to go to Walmart and pick up some ibuprofen or pick up some Tylenol or whatever they're going to pick up, that person could potentially say, hey, I'm going to go to a dispensary and pick up a 2.5 milligram edible or a 5 milligram edible. We have to constantly stay involved with research and stay involved with science. And we are seeing now the long-term effects of taking some of these over-the-counter things. There's yeah. long-term effects of taking some of that stuff. And we're really, really starting to open up the cannabis research. Obviously, it just got moved from you know a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 3. So that's really, really going to open up our options to see what this plant can really, really do. We're dealing with a very, very small amount of research now, but even within that small amount of research, we're finding all these amazing things that this plant can do. Mm -hmm. I see it on a daily basis where people come into a dispensary trying to cure one specific ailment, but then they find all these other benefits that cannabis is giving them too. Yeah. People are going in there for sleep, but then they're like, hey, wait a second, I'm losing a lot of weight when I'm when I'm ingesting cannabis, which is something kind of, you, I wouldn't expect. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, again, part of the stigma. Yeah. Can cannabis give you the munchies? Absolutely. There are specific terpenes that might induce that hunger a little bit more. And for specific people, that's an amazing thing. For a cancer patient who can't eat and really, really, need, really needs that appetite to be stimulated, then that's amazing. But the studies do defend Chronic cannabis consumers have a lower body mass index than people who do not consume cannabis. Besides the amount of calories that you put in your body, stress is also a very, very, very big factor into your body holding weight. So if you start using cannabis and affect your endocannabinoid system and your body starts falling into homeostasis, yeah. then your body starts functioning all the way around better. And I've seen so many people lose a large amount of weight and they have not changed hardly a whole lot else in their regiment, but they started using cannabis. My mom is a prime example. Um, she lost close to, I think, 30 pounds since um, she's been using cannabis. And I think it's just because her stress levels are just really, really bonded to her now. And I think she can just function in life better. And I just, I, I've seen it happen. There's a few things. I forgot, I forgot if you already mentioned how you initially got into researching it and like seeing if this was an option for you. Did we cover that? Um, we didn't. And it was kind of a funny story because it was um, at the VA hospital and just talking to a lot of veterans. Um, anger. Anger is probably yeah. one of my biggest issues, something that I st still struggle with on a daily basis. Um, cannabis has helped me out a lot with that. But just talking to a lot of veterans and veterans that are in recovery and veterans that are not going to try to steer another veteran in a bad direction, but kind of as a joke even involved in some of these group classes and even involved in some yeah. of these anger management classes. And just after the class, outside in the smoke shack, when we would do recreational time, when we would, you know, go to lunch or, you know, play dodgeball or whatever we were doing, just had so many veterans saying, Rick, have you ever thought about smoking cannabis? Yeah. And they said it just like that because I think that they had a little bit more experience with it yeah. and knew what it could do. And I think they were just kind of highlighting Hey, man, I know you're really, really against this cannabis stuff, but everything that you're talking about, you know, your anger levels, your stress levels, it might be something that you really, really need to look at. And I'm glad I did. I really, really am glad I did. Self-medication. I mean, self-medicating. That just has a very, very negative context. Yeah. Self-medicating saved my life. You know? Really? This is not advice for anybody, and I feel really, really hesitant even saying this because I know there's a lot of um, personal opinions, but... I got healthy when I stopped listening to my doctors. Wow. I took my life into my own hands and said, you know what? We really, really need to start looking at this from a different angle. And again, I haven't had a single prescription medication in over six years. 
Um, I have a lot of friends who work in the medical field, and they've told me about specific prescriptions that I think could potentially benefit me. But since I had such a negative experience with them upping my dosage, decreasing my dosage, all the kind of negative side effects that I went through, I'm probably going to put a hard line in the sand now and probably not going to take a medication that could potentially benefit me just from my from my experience. Honestly, it's like this testing thing with mm-hmm. it. And yeah, it's like, oh, let's see if this works for you. Up the dose, lower right. the dose. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try another one. It's like, right. yeah. Which is, which is another reason why I gravitated towards cannabis. You know, somebody yeah. comes in and says, Rick, I'm dealing with, you know, a lot of depressive symptoms and I really, really need to get better. And I su- suggest a specific strain to them. Um, you would never hear me say, you need to smoke this strain for a month and a half to two months straight in order for your body to adjust, adjust to it and relax. And then we could decide you're going to feel that instantaneously. Yeah. That's what it's supposed to be about. And this whole regimented thing is a little bit frustrating as well. Well, Rick, how much weed do you smoke every single day? I don't know. That's up to the day. Yeah. That's up to me. I'm not regimented. There's certain things that I do. There's certain cannabinoids that I take that I know benefit me on a daily basis. But I'm not going to just use cannabis just to use cannabis. Or I'm not going to not use it if I really, really need it at that specific time. But according to my schedule, that's not the time to use cannabis. No, this is about wellness. And one day I might not use any cannabis at all. And another day I might use a really, really large amount. Tomorrow is a very, very good example of me participating in irresponsible cannabis usage. Tomorrow's the 4th of July. (laughs) Fireworks for some veterans. And some veterans are probably going to watch this and say, oh, dude, you need to get over it. And I totally understand that because there are a lot of veterans and I have a lot of veterans friends um, that are completely fine around fireworks. Um, I've gotten better and I'm getting better. But just the kid. The, just the concussion of the fireworks still bother me. Yeah. So I know tomorrow when that sun sets that it's going to be a lot of that occurring, and I'm probably going to use a very, very large amount of cannabis, an amount that I don't usually use on any other day. But that's what I specifically need at that time. And again, one of the reasons why I gravitated towards cannabis is what happens if I use this irresponsibly? And the chances of overdose are virtually zero. Mm-hmm. I mean, people just do not overdose on it cannabis. Would, yeah, mm-hmm. I've heard it's like you'd have to it's it. do insanely amount. That's, it. That's like right. you can't even fit in a tournament. Now, can people span. use cannabis and do dumb things? I mean, that, 100%. that happens all the so, time. Yeah, it's also, the time. <laughs> it's also something I, I want to get into as well. First, I want to cover you initially. Yeah, you were struggling with the anger and all these other things were like depression and anxiety, like a, a part of your daily experience before cannabis use. Pretty much it. I mean, I was pretty much... I mean, that's what I hear most of the time when somebody walks in is looking for to get some type of assistance with cannabis. Yeah. I suffer from anxiety and I suffer from depression. And I usually ask this rhetorical question, are you anxious because you're depressed or are you depressed because you're anxious? <laughs> and I say that and it kind of makes people, you know, think a certain thing. But I guess what I mean with that is I realized I wasn't nearly as depressed as I thought I was once I got my anxiety under control. Yeah. My anxiety was leading to me drinking a lot. It was also leading to me not sleeping very well. So yeah. once I really, really focused on a lot of those anxiety feelings, started getting more restful sleep, started using the right cannabis to help me get restful mm-hmm. sleep. And I noticed that I really wasn't as depressed as I thought I was. But I just think that's very, very common. People say, I suffer from anxiety and depression. From an actual standpoint of cannabis, if somebody is suffering from Clinical depression, I'm probably going to suggest a certain type of cannabis. And if somebody's suffering from clinical anxiety, I'm going to offer another type, and they're probably going to be on two different ends of the spectrum. That's why I kind of asked that rhetorical question, because I don't want people to think, oh, here in this little jar is going to fix your anxiety and depression. You might have to buy multiple different products that are going to hit your receptors in different ways, and it's not always going to be in one thing that's going to fix all your issues. Yeah. No. And then another thing you said is self-medicating saved my life. Absolutely. So I just want to challenge you a little bit on that please, one. Please, please, please. <laughs> because self-medicating for me was, yeah, doing Xanax every day, drinking on top of it, and smoking weed all day. Mm-hmm. I'm going to assume you're self-medicating before and like quitting alcohol was just, yeah, drinking drinking on a daily basis, wouldn't you say that was you self-medicating? Absolutely. And that almost destroyed my life. Um, I mean, it was really, really bad. My liver enzymes were absolutely through the roof. 
they were debating on putting me through um, a liver transplant because it was honestly that bad. When it comes to self-medicating, I just think we need to kind of take our life back into our own hands. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of where I was at. I was so sick and tired of letting other people run my life yeah. from what kind of medication I took to what I did on a daily basis and what meeting I needed to go to. I wanted to take my life back into my own hands. And I've been able to do that with cannabis education. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really, really helped me out as far as digging into these, you know, specific compounds. Um, I know I sound kind of anti-doctor, but for me, I just <laughs> think, I just think my doctor said, we need to really, really start questioning that. Just hear a lot of my doctor said, my doctor said, my doctor said. Um, my mom went in for a, a regular checkup a couple months ago yeah. and got her blood work done and her cholesterol was very, very high. And when she was walking out of the office, the doctor handed her a prescription for Lipitor. Mm -hmm. And I think with my mom educating herself and me and her having a pretty close relationship, um, I think I've challenged her a little bit because she said, I challenged the doctor. And I said to the doctor, I have not been watching my diet. I have not been exercising the way I should be. Is it possible that I could potentially change my, my diet and we could retest this blood work in three to four months and find out if I need a prescription medication. The fact that that conversation is not even occurring, I think mm, is criminal. You before know? like prescribing Absolutely. a medication. Absolutely. There's so many different ways. I mean, from anything, I just think this is not just about cannabis. I just think we have to look at plant medicine and we have to look at other things that we could take that could really, really benefit us from different supplements, breathing techniques, yeah. exercise. I mean, I tell people this all the time. If somebody made me give up, cannabis or give up exercise, I would give up cannabis in a heartbeat. Mm. I really, really would. Um, there are so many things that I do on a daily basis that help with my mental health, cannabis being one of them, but there's other things as well that I have to do. I mean, different supplements that I take, yeah. um, just different practices that I have to do on a, you know, on a daily basis in order to stay sober. Interesting. I definitely hear everything you're saying, but it's funny because you're like, I wanted to take my life back into my own hands. Right. And that's the exact opposite of what I've been taught. Like your life should not be in your hands. Like and you, if you run your life, it's going to the ground. You well, know what I mean? I don't look at one addiction being any stronger or weaker than the next. I think addictions, yeah. obviously, depending on what you're addicted to, could dramatically change your life. But this is going to be hard for me to say because I don't want to bother any AA supporters or NA supporters, but you know, the whole telling on yourself thing, yeah. you know, I think it's super, super important to tell on yourself. Oh, yeah. But it's this idea of, hey, 2.30 in the morning and you're really, really craving this alcoholic drink. What do you need to do? Well, that's why you go to the meetings, because now you have all these contacts and you have your sponsor and you can reach out to them and you can call them and say, I'm really, really struggling. I'm really, really, I really, really need help. Do we have that same attitude of somebody who's opening their freezer and eating three bowls of ice cream at 2 30 in the morning you mm. know you need to call somebody you need to <laughs> i guess what i'm kind of trying to say is it's okay to internalize this a lot of this stuff and i don't want to give anybody any bad advice and saying you just need to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and do this but i think taking your life back into your own hands can look a lot different for a lot of people yeah. and what really really scared me was covid mm. COVID didn't actually scare me. What scared me was the recovery world when it came to COVID. I saw how many people relapsed during COVID. Mm -hmm. And it a little bit strengthened my cause because I think so many people are so reliant on, I need to go to this building every single day. I need to go to this meeting. I need to do this and I need to do that. What if you're in a position where those things are absolutely taken away from you and you have no other option whatsoever? Are you going to crumble? You know, or do you have enough in you to say, no, I'm in this for the long haul. And I think some of this is having a support group is very, very, very important, but really just challenging yourself. And I'm a little bit on being hard on yourself. I'm, I'm very, very, very hard on myself, probably to a flaw. But <laughs> I think it's really, really important because I just have so many, so many things that I need to do and so many um, goals that I want to achieve. Yeah. And probably a little bit of that Marine Corps mentality. Yeah. But I think just this idea of, you know, sure. I constantly need somebody somebody else. Very important to have that support system. But 
you're a lot more powerful and a lot more stronger than you realize. Yeah. And I think people need to give themselves a little bit of that confidence, say, I got this. I absolutely yeah. got this. I think I'm a little hard on myself too. And I have to constantly remind myself I'm a human fucking being and mm-hmm. I make mistakes and mm-hmm. I'm not always going to be perfect. Right. Some days I'm going to show up late, but at least I showed up. Right. Sometimes it's harder to show up. Right. Also with being in the Marine Corps, you said you had suffered with towards like with a lot of PTSD. Correct. So what are kind of like the benefits with that, with medical marijuana and PTSD? I feel like cannabis just gives me um, the ability to take a deep breath. Um, Somebody actually said, I actually said that. I said, I can physically show you what cannabis does to me. And they said, how? And I said, (sighs) (laughs) and that's sometimes all it is. It just allows me. I'm very, very tense, um, very, very rigid um, all the time. And I think cannabis just gives me that time to just take a step back and relax and really, really process a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what I was talking about with the sativa and indica stuff. Um, I had a patient um, who was a middle-aged woman and she was, you could just tell from talking to her, she was very, very, very high strung. And she was talking about using cannabis in the morning. And I suggested to her that she starts using some indica dominant strains, indica meaning indica couch. Um, that scared her because she said, Rick, I don't want to be tired. I don't want to be tired. I don't want to be tired in the morning. I said, I'm not trying to make you tired, I'm trying to make you calm down. Mm-hmm. So she came back a couple weeks later and she gave me some really, really good feedback. And she said, Rick, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm moving so much slower in the morning, but I'm getting so many more things done. Mm. I think it's the cannabis was allowing her to focus very, very, very scattered brains. And maybe a sativa strain for somebody like that might not be the best option. So I kind of had to look at it like that. But as far as uh, my PTSD goes, especially my sleep, My sleep was probably my biggest issue on why I initially got my medical cannabis card. And looking in and diving into all those other cannabinoids as well. I mean, CBN. CBN is a cannabinoid that is very, very, very good for sleep. It's not only good for falling asleep, it's good for staying asleep. Because there would be times where I would be okay falling asleep, but then I would wake up every hour and a half, every two hours. Mm -hmm. So just the fact that I'm getting quality sleep now, and I don't want to sit here for any veteran that's watching this, You know, oh, as soon as you start using cannabis, you're going to get eight hours of sleep. Absolutely not. You know, it doesn't completely fix anything. But I can get five to six hours of quality sleep now, which has absolutely changed my life. You know, it really, really has because I'm a big believer. And if you don't have good sleep, you don't probably don't have a good, just a good health. You know, underestimate the power of sleep. Very much so. Really do. Very, very, very much so. You also mentioned like this isn't for everybody. And it might not be a recovery route for everybody. What are kind of the negatives you've seen? Because I've I've mainly I've had people on the podcast before, mainly speak on the negatives and never on like the positives, like right, how you are. Right. But what have you seen like have that have been the negatives? Cannabis personally gives me what I need. Yeah, there are other people that it doesn't, especially if somebody has a a large experience with other drugs as well. Yeah. I mean, I've even had people come into a dispensary and say, what strain is going to most resemble the effects of Xanax? Crazy. And I've straight up told them, I cannot give you any suggestions whatsoever. And they said, really? I said, this is a totally different totally, world. Totally, totally different world. Totally, totally different drug. <laughs> now, again, I am not in control of anybody, but looking at that guy, I would say he might be one of those people that we really, really need to focus on that cannabis consumption might not be the best for them. It will make somebody run. If somebody really, really wants to, I need something harder. I need something stronger. Absolutely. It could potentially do that. I know plenty of people, I, a little bit of guilt associated, but I need to understand that I can't hold that guilt too much. But, um, I preach cannabis just because how much it's helped me. And I know it's helping other people, but there was a gentleman that I know that very, very, very new to cannabis, got his medical card and, saw him at a smoke shop within 30 days of him getting his medical card. And I asked him what he was purchasing. And he said he was purchasing a dab rig, you know, yeah. I dab. Yeah. I dab. And I think dabbing um, with education is very, very, very beneficial. But within 30 days of getting his medical card and he's looking into getting a dab rig and come to find out through other friends and stuff, Cannabis wasn't so good for him. You know, he yeah. kind of went off the deep end and he decided to kind of go back into other things. And that's typically you know? the experiences I hear. That's why this is new to me. 
Right. Because in being in the recovery, like I've lived in sober living for 18 months. I've seen people come in and out and even in meetings, um, people sharing like, you know, I thought weed would be a good option for me. It's legal in, in like a lot of states. And I tried it out within like a week. Sometimes it's like the same day. Sometimes it's within a week or a slower progression, like in two months. I'm back to my drug of choice, like Xanax or whatever it is. So it's like, yeah, I've heard, I've heard of stories like that. But I also do believe you in terms of it can help people and they can kind of just stick. Well, it's kind of like um, a review on Google. People are ad- always going to tell you their negative experience. People are never going to tell you about their positive experience. I mean, the fact that we're on an F the Stigma podcast, I think that's a big part of it because people will be very, very open, especially in the recovery world, to tell you their negative experience when it comes to cannabis. But when it comes to the positive experience, it's this very, very, very big hush-hush. Yeah. And I think it's created a environment where people are lying to each other. Mm-hmm. I have s- ran into so many people that say, Hey, Rick, I use a cannabis vape pen at nighttime, but my sponsor doesn't know about it. Nobody else needs to know about it. This is my business and my business only, so I don't need to share this information to anybody else. I think that's F the stigma. Yeah. I think that's what, what, what it's coming down to is people aren't just being open and honest about what they're using. And if I'm using a vape pen for sleep and it's benefiting me, I don't think I'm some anomaly and think, oh, this vape pen just works for me. If it can work for somebody else, too, then I'm going to share that information. And I think that's kind of what's happening is we've created an environment where if people are using it, they're being really, really, really hush-hush about it. Yeah. But if they had a neg- negative experience, hey, let's talk about it. Let's yeah. highlight it. Let's highlight it. Let's highlight it. When I just see it on a daily basis of people actively in recovery coming into a dispensary, going to meetings, getting their chips, you know, talking to their sponsor, being a sponsor, you know, working the steps and just being very, very quiet and very, very hush hush about their cannabis consumption. I think that's very disingenuous. Another debate I've seen with it is leaving all the substances just to pick up another one is what I've heard. It's like these other examples like ketamine treatment. I've seen like ketamine, like ads for ketamine clinics like in L.A., like bill- billboards for it. But yeah, there's like people I value and like I would even call them my mentors. Like, why would you pick up? leave all your drugs like that's why you why you went to treatment and then pick up another one for your recovery. And I think that's all about education. I think it's all about being used um, appropriately mm-hmm. and responsibly because 10 years ago, if you would have talked to me about LSD for treatment or MDMA for treatment or psilocybin for treatment, mm-hmm. I would be like, absolutely not. You're complete. I think every drug has its place and every drug has its purpose. And if it's used correctly and if it's used scientifically, we can really, really learn how to use a lot of these compounds that we've been told our entire lives are terrible for us and how they could potentially benefit us. Sometimes I'll hear people say, man, cannabis really, really hasn't made me any better and I'm just going to quit smoking cannabis. It makes me all foggy and I don't feel like I'm myself and I just want to be done with it. I think we need to be a little bit more compassionate and ask each other more questions. Okay, how much cannabis are you using? How often are you using it? What time of the day are you using? I mean, water, we all, water is good for you. Water is healthy. Mm -hmm. If you drank 10 gallons of water right now, you could potentially die. Does that mean that water is bad for you? Absolutely not. You can overdo things. It means that you did not use it the way it's supposed to be used. Like people using cannabis, you know, I just got to be done with it. Well, I'm smoking like seven grams a day. Okay, well, have you tried smoking a gram a day? Have you tried smoking two grams, three grams? Yeah. Maybe it's the amount, but it's just this very, very anti-cannabis world that I think we still live in, even though people are kind of coming on board in the recovery world. I just think we have to look at it as this could potentially be used as medication. And if we're going to be okay with people taking antidepressants, people taking Suboxone, Mm. people drinking eight cups of coffee a day. (laughs) I mean, caffeine. And there's a lot of studies out there because that's what it comes down to too is, well, this science says, well, the, who, who is, who is representing this? Where is this information actually coming from? Because for every article that is anti-cannabis, I can go out there and find you an article that is supporting cannabis and how it could potentially benefit, you know, somebody. 
If you are against cannabis and you're getting all of your information from IHateWeed.com, that might be a problem. If I'm pro-cannabis and I'm getting all my information from WeedIsAwesome.com, that's a problem as well. I think we need to be really, really honest that when this information is presented to us, we have to say, oh, wow, we have to look at this from a different perspective. Yeah, check the sources. E- even if it's information that's saying, hey, cannabis might not be as awesome as you think it is because of this specific thing, I'm willing to look at that and I'm willing to open my eyes and say, okay, this is something schizophrenia. Yeah. You know, like, so you know, we're talking about, you know, schizophrenia. I mean, I think it's pretty much been decided through the cannabis community as well that schizophrenics probably have no business using cannabis whatsoever because it could potentially put them into a tailspin. It could be very, very dangerous. Now, schizophrenia makes up 1% of our population, you know? So yes, is that something that we should be concerned about? Yes, but we're also talking about it could potentially benefit a lot of other people too, just because it's bad for this one specific person doesn't mean it's a bad drug in general. Like, for example, hydroxyzine made me entirely too sleepy. It felt like, you know, it's like I'm taking this to go to sleep and I'm using it. I'm prescribed it for anxiety and they're telling me to take it in the morning and then we switched it to at night. I don't know. It was this whole weird thing. But certain drugs can make people feel a certain way. There's those negative side effects. Of Absolutely. Like, even with these prescription medications that doctors give you, we can still feel not ourselves. Right. Lithium, I've heard people feel like they're not as in tune with their emotions and right. all these things, they still feel blocked. Right. Even the antidepressants that I was on um, through the VA hospital, I mean, f- from the actual definition, it did their job because it kept me from being depressed. You know what it also kept me from? It kept me from being happy as well. Mm. I was very, very, very moot. I was very, very monotone. I felt like a zombie. Um, maybe my emotions weren't so erratic, but again, I just felt like I was just existing and I didn't feel like this was any way to live life whatsoever. I think you're supposed to go through emotions. I think yeah. you're supposed to go through sadness and happiness and anger. And I think yeah. it's important to feel all those things. And I think we're constantly trying to put drugs into us that make us not feel that way. And I don't know. And cannabis doesn't do that for me. Yeah. In fact, it does the exact opposite. I had a gentleman wow. probably about a year ago, and he said, I need to return this vape cartridge. And I said, can you explain to me what happened? He said, I was using it before I went to bed, and I stepped into my bathroom, and I looked into my mirror, and I just started looking at myself, and I started questioning my own life and the good things that I've done and the bad things that I've done and where I need to go and how my relationships are with my family. And it really, really, it was just a really, really uncomfortable feeling and I didn't like it. And I put my hand out and I said, congratulations, you got high. (laughs) Cannabis has challenged me on so many different things. It's challenged me on an emotional level. It's challenged me on a spiritual level. Um, I am probably way more emotional now, but a healthy emotional, not so much anger, but really, really feeling certain things. Um, sympathetic my sympathetic um empathetic uh, my marine corps friends are probably gonna if they ever see this call i shouldn't have been in the marines i 100 percent should not yeah. have been in the marines and it's, i know that it's a hard thing to do it is it's a very very hard thing and the way i know that is my mother um going through a lot of mental health a lot of suicidal ideations um my mother told me a story that we grew up in Carroll County in Northern Carroll County, we had about two acres of land and we had a very, very big garden and there was a rabbit getting into our garden and my father was getting very, very frustrated because it was eating all the vegetables and everything else. We put up a fence. It wasn't happening. So my father had a rifle and he said, Hey, if you ever see that rabbit out there, let me know. Cause I want to, you know, I want to shoot I, that. I, I want to yeah. take care of it. You know? <laughs> so I was all excited. You know, I think I was probably about five years old and I was all excited. I said, dad, dad, the rabbit's out there. The rabbit's out there. So my dad went out there, you know, got a little, got up on the deck, you know, aimed at it, shot the rabbit. And I was so excited. Yes, yes, yes. I started running down with my dad. My dad's coming, walking down. And I looked down and I saw the dead rabbit. And I'm going to try not to get emotional. I'm going to cry about a rabbit, but it's not about the rabbit. But um, my mom said she really, really impacted her because she said, I looked down at that rabbit. I looked at my dad. I looked down at the rabbit, and I looked at my dad again, and I said, what if that rabbit shot you? Hmm. And 
somebody saying something like that, um, probably not the best fit for the Marine Corps. <laughs> the Marine Corps is um, very, very, very important to drill a certain type of mentality in. Um, we have a mission, and mission first, mission first always. But I feel like I lost a lot of myself um, in those years and being in the Marine Corps and really lost kind of who I was as, as a person, which probably led to a lot of my drinking. Um, I've had a lot of therapists say that, you know, I, I definitely suffer from, you know, self-sabotage. I have this, I don't feel like I deserve to be happy mm. from some of the things that um, I participated in overseas. I just feel like I don't deserve that happiness. So even still to this day, when I feel like good things are happening, I might not even do it consciously, but I kind of sometimes throw a wrench in there because I don't feel like I'm fully deserving of experiencing this happiness with everything that I've been through. You know, talking to other Marine Corps friends and I had a Marine Corps friend who was um, pretty hard. You know, he was a def they had a really, really hard exterior. And we were talking on the phone one day, and he said, do you ever think about things, man, that happened when we were in the Marines? And I said, absolutely, all the time. And I was like, oh, we got a moment here. He's going to open up. He's really, really going to break down. He said, yeah, man, I just really, really miss going to those bars on Friday nights and hanging out with the boys. And, and that goes to show you that, Two people can have the exact same experience and react to it totally, totally, totally differently. There are people who have experienced way less in combat than I have mm. and are dealing with it way, way harder. And there are people who have experienced way more in combat and are dealing with it way, way, way better than I am. So I think that's kind of what it comes down to. When it comes to mental health, I think we're also we're always putting up dividers and divisions, you know? Oh, well, Rick, you have PTSD and it's combat PTSD, so it's worse than mine. There's no worse or better. PTSD is PTSD. It's post-traumatic. It's a traumatic event that happened to you and you handled it in a certain way. And that's what we have to talk about. But I feel like we're always trying to put people in these little boxes like, oh, well, you have PTSD, but I have CPTSD. I've never heard of that one. And it's like, let's not really try to divide ourselves so much let's find out what we have in common yeah. rather than what we have you know the the, the big differences that we yeah. have especially when it comes to mental health so i feel like i don't have the ability just to connect with other veterans i feel like i have the ability to connect with anybody yeah. who's experiencing any type of you know ptsd symptoms so you said that you kind of you were losing yourself with like being in the marine corps and in your drinking so i'm assuming you've maybe found more of who you are today mm -hmm. and i want to ask you who that is Whew. Right? That's a that's a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out who I am. I think I'm trying to take bits and pieces from my life and using that to benefit others. That's what I'm all about. As much as the as as terrible of an experience that I had in the Marine Corps, I have to take a lot of those good things that the Marine Corps taught me and now use that in my life to potentially better somebody else. When it comes to discipline, when it comes to really being a man of your word, when it comes to accountability, those are all things. I was already taught a lot of those growing up, but the Marine Corps really kind of solidified a lot of those. I just think I had to work on more of the emotional aspect of things, more of the empathy, more of the caring. Um, it's become very, very natural to me with cannabis consumption to be like that. I don't have to try to be empathetic. It's just something that I naturally yeah. am. And I think cannabis has really, really opened that up to me as far as really um, just trying to help the next person. There are just so many people out there that need help. I was just talking to my mom about this this morning, but even people that are coming into a dispensary, like some of the time it's not even talking about their medication. It's talking about their life. Yeah, People are lonely. People are sad. People want to be talked to. People want to feel appreciated. And I think that we can really, really do a lot better with that. And cannabis has really, really opened that up to me. I mean, when it comes to medication, too, that's why we kind of have to push ourselves as well. Like, well, when you're taking a Xanax or when you're taking an antidepressant, are you calling your friends up and saying, hey, come over to my house. We're all going to take antidepressants together. No, <laughs> but you can 100 percent do that with cannabis. And I think that's something that we should do with cannabis. Yes, I think it is medicinal, but it's something that can also really, really benefit people socially as well. And that's, it is something that we can enjoy together. I mean, think about just going back thousands of years, peace pipe. There's a reason why I call it a, you know, call it a peace pipe. A lot of things occur when people are taking something that is mind altering, but it also opens up your mind at the same time. One of the quotes that I really, really like, and it's kind of funny, but it is true. 
Five drunk guys start a fight. Five stone guys start a band. <laughs> There's a reason why music has a I lot think. of a lot of cannabis undertones too, because it really, really allows the brain to really, really open up. I think there's a lot of, I think being with people and doing things with people in general is a healing thing to do and a beautiful thing to do. Right. We have bars everywhere. I mean, there are, you know, bars every Yeah, everyone wants to drink together. Well, yeah, it's yeah. just a place for people just to go and relax and drink maybe one or two of these drinks and just take a, take the edge off and just enjoy each other's company. Yeah. But then if you ever would bring that up, especially where I live, but if you would ever bring that up in a cannabis realm, people go, whoa, whoa, You're, whoa. This is out of hand. Alcohol does not have any medicinal benefits. Cannabis does. Even if somebody is not looking for the medicinal benefits, they're still getting the medicinal benefits. Yeah, alcohol is, mm -hmm. there's, it's just horrible for you mm -hmm. all around. Mm -hmm. I think... What I've mainly got from this is recovery is honestly, it's not, it's not so black and white and there's many different routes for people. And I really hope that other people can kind of see the different perspective and not be so harsh and like anti you're smoking weed. So you're not in recovery. Like recovery is literally does not mean abstinence. It looks, yeah, it looks just different for everybody. When I was really, really early on, um, attending a lot of those AA meetings, yeah. Um, I just heard a lot of anti can anti cannabis sentiment just because it they're was they're anti kind of, everything, of course. Right. It was really, <laughs> really bad. And it was just very I felt like I was lying because my anxiety is so bad and my PTSD is so bad that sometimes I use cannabis in order to get out of my house. I'm mm. not talking about I mean Depending on my medication levels, I'm always responsible when it comes to driving. But as far as leaving my house, cannabis helps me leave my house very, very, very often from an anxiety perspective. So yeah. when I'm sitting there in a meeting and somebody's telling me, oh, my God, cannabis is so, so, so bad. And I'm thinking to myself, the only reason I'm here right now at this AA meeting is because I'm under the influence of cannabis. I didn't say I'm high because it all depends on what level that is. But if I take the right amount of cannabis that is going to help with my anxiety, do yeah. I feel like I'm under the influence of cannabis? Absolutely. Yeah. Do I feel like I'm high? No, I don't feel like I'm high. But now I'm sitting in a meeting and somebody's telling me how terrible this is, but I'm thinking the only reason I'm here right now is because I'm under the influence of that. So now, yeah. I'm, now, and there's, I'm, now I'm very confused. Yeah, <laughs> and, now there's, and there's also people that can smoke weed and it will prevent them from leaving the house. Yep. Yep. It really, it's different for everybody. Yep. Which is something I really want to emphasize. Right. Before we kind of started, you mentioned something about not in agreeing with chem an, a chemical imbalance, that drug addicts and alcoholics don't suffer from a chemical imbalance. I'm, yeah. That's really tough for me, and it's really, really debatable, but I just think that um, often we regurgitate things that we hear especially in the recovery world. Oh, this person said it. My sponsor said it. Ten people in AA said it, so it must be true. Yeah. Um, I think we really, really just need to challenge ourselves. Obviously, I have always challenged my doctors, and I will still continue to challenge my doctors, even though I don't really speak with them all that much because I've found so much relief in cannabis. But um, really, even when it comes to, like, a chemical imbalance, I mean, I would highly suggest that people dig into that. You know, be, maybe dig into the idea that, Maybe a chemical imbalance is completely a myth. Um, when it comes to that, there's been some studies done that that was created by the pharmaceutical industry. If somebody is telling you this is not your fault and you have something in your brain that is imbalanced, you're pretty much saying I'm going to be on this drug for absolutely the rest of my life because I have a chemical imbalance. And I just don't Man. know if that's scientifically defended. I mean, and doctors prescribe things and want to keep you on them. I think there's a profit in it for them is what I've heard. Right. Um, and that's kind of where I go a little bit more conspiracy theory. <laughs> but when it comes down to it, yeah. like part of my reasoning and thinking that people are so anti-cannabis, like what happens if a lot of start, if a lot of people start using cannabis and a lot of people get healthy, what happens? People lose a lot of money. Yeah. People lose a lot of money. The pharmaceutical industry loses a lot of money. A lot of other that's, industries that's lose That's something a, America wants to keep too. alive. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, even the ability now. I mean, as last year, it's July 2nd, though July 3rd today. But even uh, last a year ago is when it got legalized recreationally. You can grow two of your own plants if you don't have your medical card. If you do have your medical card, you can grow four of your own plants. 
I mean, the pharmaceutical industry does not like the idea that people can legitimately grow their own medicine now. That's very, very scary. They want you on that Xanax. They want you on this prescription medication. They want you on this mood stabilizer. Yeah. You know, when I just think there's a lot of other ways to look at it. And again, it's not all about cannabis. I do a lot of other supplementation as well. It's not just about cannabis. Okay. My diet is very, very important. I mean, I even heard um, somebody else on this podcast even talking about gut health. Oh, gut yeah. health, gut health is extremely, oh, extremely yeah. important. And that is how I think we are really, really limiting cannabis by talking about THC and CBD. CBG is a very, very powerful cannabinoid in cannabis that is really meant to directly attack the gastrointestinal area. I've had so many people come into the dispensary and get so much relief with Crohn's disease, with IBS, because they're ingesting CBG. CBG is mildly psychoactive. It's not psychoactive like THC. And you could start talking about those different ratios. Wow. But there are people who are taking very, very low dose of THC and combining with a high amount of CBG and getting that gastrointestinal relief. So it really, really all depends on how you really look at this plant. Okay. And then mm -hmm. just another question with the chemical imbalance. You're saying it's kind of up in the air if that's a real thing, or you believe it's not a I real believe thing. it's not. You know, I, I really, really do. I just, um, again, a little bit conspiracy theory, but just it was really created by the pharmaceutical industry and just this yeah. idea that it's this idea that you don't have any power. You don't have any control. This isn't your fault. You have a chemical imbalance. I do not want to sit here and sound like I am completely anti-pharmaceutical medication. Yeah. I know there are so many people out there that are benefiting from pharmaceutical medication, and it can yeah. really, really benefit their life. There's really people in the world that prefer Western medicine, which is like prescribed meds, right. and then people here in the West that really like the Eastern way of like plants and right. more natural herbs, all that shit. Exactly. But what about like in terms of, because I've, yeah, I've been under this idea that certain people like are literally born more prone to be depressed because of the way their brain is just, just is. And I'm sure there's plenty of scientific scientific articles that completely defend that. Yeah. And again, there's probably some that say, I don't know how true that is, you know? So yeah. that's kind of where we have to say, question everything. That's just what I want people to do. I want people to just start using their brains and start questioning everything. When people are like, oh, I took this, I'm taking this new pharmaceutical and it's amazing. And I don't care what you say, Rick. I don't care if it has this and that. We don't know what the long-term effects of those are. Yeah. What happens in 10 years when a new study comes out and says, oh, wow, we found that this does this. You see it on the commercials all the time. I mean, targeted dyskinesia. They are now prescribing medication for people to reduce their face being coming contorted, to reduce their hands from doing certain movements from taking pharmaceutical medication. I mean, this is absolutely insane to me. Yeah. When cannabis has been around for thousands of years and people have been using it for thousands of years, is there psychoactive properties to it? Absolutely. I mean, the whole idea of, well, the weed nowadays is so much stronger than the weed back in the 50s or back in the 60s. I can kind of agree with that. But now we have to talk about that. If we are saying that ingesting any type of smoke into your lungs is a bad thing, which I can kind of agree with as well, then wouldn't we want to smoke something where we didn't have to ingest that much of it? If the cannabis is that much stronger now, then I'm going to get those desired effects with ingesting way less cannabis smoke into my lungs than I would at a 15% THC strain. Yeah. That might not be strong enough for me, and I might need to ingest that a lot more times in order to get that desired effect. Yeah. So it kind of really all depends on how you look at it. I really appreciate you for coming on the podcast and sharing this perspective, and I really hope this helps people maybe not see different forms of medication in such a black and white way. Right. It's definitely opened my eyes and I'm blown away. Honestly. Well, I mean, I hope it impacts somebody. I mean, I have some really, really big plans. Um, I like to do things, make sure they're done the absolute right way, but I have some plans to start a recovery program, hopefully in Kara County for people who are actively using cannabis. When I say that, I wish I didn't have to. Yeah. If that makes any sense. I really, really, really wish I didn't have to. I think we really need to come on board with this and that this doesn't have any political lines anymore. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a Democrat. People are supporting cannabis. This is a plant. 
that is being grown out of the ground and can really, really, really benefit people. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather, and people will say, well, maybe I'll try it at some point. Let me do this and this and this, and maybe I'll try it at some point. I think the exact opposite. If I'm going to try something, I want to try something first that I know I have zero chance of overdosing on, and I know that it's completely natural, not something that's made in a lab and could potentially have some really, really bad side effects, even long-term side effects, you know, 10, 20 years after using it. Mm -hmm. So I just think we really need to start challenging ourselves and opening our minds to what do we see medication as, Yeah. You know? Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on the I podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks so much.